Yes, yes. Amazing. This was such a fascinating documentary. Robin Roberts, James Reese Europe the third, Professor Sammons, thank you so much. Harlem, thank you so much. The Harlem Hell Fighters. <laughs> Give it up one more time. One more time. So if everyone can please take their seats, we're actually going to uh, introduce and allow uh, some of the uh, people who were featured in this documentary to, to come on stage and, and talk to us. But before we do that, some of you may be wondering who I am. My name is Selena Hill. I'm an award-winning journalist. The, thank you. The deputy editor at Black Enterprise an on-air talent host and the moderator of this talk back. I am so honored to even be here tonight. I'm also honored to be living in the greatest community in the world, Harlem. Anybody else here from Harlem? Yes, fellow Harlem Knights. So without further ado, we are going to welcome to the stage an amazing panel of speakers. Tonight we have with us Good Morning America co-anchor and the executive producer and narrator of the Harlem Health Fighters. Please welcome Robin Roberts to the stage. We also have with us James Reese Europe the third, the grandson of the legendary band leader, James Reese Europe. And lastly, we have with us Professor Jeffrey Sammons, a professor of history at New York University and a World War I history historian. Thank you, thank you for being here tonight. We're gonna wait for Professor Sammons. Thank you so much. Okay, so before we start this discussion, I told Robin backstage that I received a text message this morning from my, my aunt who says, you know, Selena, you need to watch this um, documentary. It's coming out you know, on Sunday, you know, February 4th. Um, it's about the Harlem Hellfighters, and it's about your great uncle, Major Edward H. Hunter. So I call my aunt, and I'm like, Aunt Debbie, what? <laughs> what is going on? And she says, let me call up your great, great cousin, Valerie Freeman. So cousin Valerie gets on the phone, and she says, Selena, yes, my father was a major in the Harlem Hellfighters. He fought in World War II, but on top of that, his father-in-law, Fleming Mac Thomas, fought in the original Harlem Hellfighters in France in World War I. Wow. And I, I would have never known that I was this connected to the history of the Harlem Hellfighters and the great service that they did for this country. And I wanna say thank you, Robin, and thank you both and all the producers of this film because this is what this is about. You know, this is not taught enough. And Robin, I'll start the discussion here because this, that was a fascinating fact for me to learn. You, as the producer, uh, executive producer of this documentary, was there anything that really took you by surprise? Oh my goodness, I mean, just hearing you say what you did, and I'm just one of many, um, and just so proud. And I did learn so much. Uh, you know, my father being a Tuskegee Airman, um, and hey! And that's how I came to this project, because, um, with History Channel, I did a documentary on the Tuskegee Airmen. And they immediately said, um, we had this story about the Harlem Hellfighters. And I was, I was somewhat embarrassed that I didn't know 
their story, to tell you the truth, Selena. I thought, I, I, I should know the, the story. And so everything about their story surprised me because I had so little knowledge. I didn't know about your, he was Pharrell? Your, your granddaddy was Pharrell? I mean, you know, that's what, that's what he said, you know, that I, I had no idea of the this influence. Good at well, I don't do, but I like Pharrell. I mean, I, I mean, Duke's been. cool, but but I had no idea of, of, of beyond what they did in the war as far as fighting and helping the Allies, the influence that they had in culture over there. That was very surprising to me. How many in the room were also surprised by or learning uh, uh, learning to learn about the history of the Harlem Hellfighters? Okay. How many already knew about their rich history? Okay, so it's about half and half in the room. You know, James, I want to talk about that because your grandfather, again, legendary band leader, James Reese Europe, um, was iconic and so important in American history, but still so little known about him. Can you talk about what this means for you to have your grandfather honored in this way, in this documentary, what does that mean for you personally? Well, our whole Europe family is tremendously proud of my grandfather, of course, and we're tremendously proud of the work that you have done. Um, I've looked at a lot of videos and I've read a lot of books, but I'm still learning from that film things that I still had not known about him. And Professor Salmon, could you yeah. bring that up to the Emmy committee when we're up for an <laughs> Emmy? Could you just, it's R O B I N R O B. <laughs> Definitely Emmy worthy. No, 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 sure. but that, that means a lot. I mean, as, as a storyteller, to hear somebody who knew the history of their father to learn something new, and that's what is very exciting about people who knew nothing about them, but even those who did. Well, there are only something. so many photographs of my grandfather, and I thought I had seen them all, but I saw a couple of new ones today. No, great. Wow. It, it, it's so funny. My, my great cousin texted me a picture of her father wearing in uniform, and it's a close-up picture of him wearing the 369th badge of honor on, and it just meant so much. Again, the history is so rich, but not enough people know about it. And you know, speaking of history, Professor Sammons, um, you talked about in the film W.E.B. E. Du Bois and the role that he played when it came to enlisting African Americans into the army. And then afterward, when they returned home, how they returned to such racial tension. Can you expand on that and, and just the significance that uh, W.E.B. Du Bois played. Well, I'll start with Du Bois, uh, who was a great friend of Charles Young, Colonel Charles Young, who should have been the first black general, was the third black graduate of, of the United States Military <laughs> Academy at West Point. They met at Wilberforce. So Du Bois was very much into the military, and he also spent time in Germany, and he understood the Germans. And before he wrote, we return fighting or returning soldiers, he wrote something called Close Ranks, in which he encouraged blacks to support the war effort, to put aside their special grievances, and to fight shoulder to shoulder with whites for democracy. Now, Du Bois was not naive. He clearly understood that uh, blacks didn't have democracy in America. Uh, but they wouldn't get it unless blacks showed that they were worthy of it. And the best way to do that was to fight and die for it. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. One thing that uh, might interest you, with all that we saw that the Harlem Hellfighters did, the 369th in this film, how they demonstrated their bravery, courage, discipline, etc. There was a 1925 report by the Army War College that said that blacks were afraid, black soldiers were afraid of the dark, <laughs> that they were undisciplined, uh, that they were only a threat to themselves, to women, and to children, and that they didn't respect officers, et cetera. This led to virtual disappearance of the black soldier heading toward World War II. And do you know that the same thing that happened to these soldiers in World War I happened to them again 
in World War II, and not a single black soldier from World War II received the Medal of Honor, and none did from World War I until 1993, Freddie Stowers from South Carolina, and then Henry Johnson in 2015, and they're the only two black soldiers from World War I to have received the Medal of Honor. And that took 97 right. years. Yes. And seven from World War II. But yet, in I'm sorry, but yet in France, they received the highest medal of honor exactly. in France. Exactly. 174 men of the regiment received the Croix de Guerre from the, Fr the, highest. the French Cross of War. And One the health entire fight. regiment received it as, as well. It's One cool. of the health fighters in a letter that he wrote home said that the French were completely without prejudice. He had to look in the mirror to remember that he was black. The same thing, my cousin was telling me that when Major Edward H. Hunter was serving, he was infuriated by the fact of how he was treated here on U.S. soil. And that leads me to the next question for the panel. Where did this sense of patriotism come from for, you know, with these soldiers who were fighting for democracy for the rest of the world but didn't even have basic rights in their homeland? I think they were trying to earn it. They thought if they went there and they fought bravely and did what the, uh, was expected of them, that they would come home and be accepted as full citizens. And that, that was the only battle that the uh, hell fighters lost. They couldn't lay claim, as you heard in the film, until they were like every other American in taking a stake. I, I remember my father, again, Tuskegee Airmen, and asking him, and it's much like, the Harlem Hellfighters, who said, I said, Dad, you know, what was it like? And he said, they did feel the, the weight of the community. And he said, failure was not an option. And the same thing that the Harlem Hellfighters felt. Failure was not an option. My dad was patriotic, pure and simple. He was a, a young boy, uh, New Jersey, across the river, um, South Orange. He got, okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> You hear that, Daddy? Um, he was, he was, yeah, he was cute, too. He was a good fat boy. Um, but he, he as, as a young man, would go down the basement, took a sawed-off broomstick handle, dreamed that he was flying at a time when blacks had no rights in this country. But he, he dreamed of flying. He dreamed of being in the military. And there's something very inherent that we don't talk enough about in the black community, our allegiance to the military going back to the, the Buffalo Soldiers in every single war. And, it, no, and, it's, and it's, but it goes against the narrative that is taught to many of us. It, it's, 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 it's a counterclaim to the false assertions of the inabilities of black people if you, if, you, if you lift them up and show them as the heroes that they have been in the military. But to go back to your question, why did they do it? Well, they, they did it because they wanted to prove themselves Absolutely. to be men. Uh, and, and they had been denied that. They were boys or less than. Uh, but I wanted to say something about this film and what it does that other films that I've seen on the subject of the military uh, or even of the 369th haven't done. One, I've never seen a war film or a film related to the military that has a female narrator. Yes, we did a fantastic job. Second, it privileges the black female voice and fem other female voices. And I mention that uh, uh, because women have been written out of the military in a sense. And we know that two of the soldiers killed in Iraq oh, were yeah. female uh, and uh, one black uh, male, all black, but two women. So this film shows that women have a place in the military, that they understand what war is, a, is about, even though we don't see women serving. 
Uh, there were the two black women in the AEF, uh, and there's a book on that subject, how they uh, worked in the canteens in uh, France uh, to serve the black soldiers. But it's only recently, like, you know, maybe 25 or less years ago, that women were really allowed to be in combat. So uh, yeah. this, this film is, is, is remarkable uh, uh, for that. Uh, uh, reason. And, and your voice, Robin, I, I told you backstage, such an iconic voice in broadcast journalism and media, and the fact that you lent your voice to further amplify this film um, is it, just fantastic. But you know, you got a little emotional, and I wanted to ask, where does that emotion come from when you think about the film and you're talking about it? Oh, goodness. Why you gotta do that to me? Yeah, come on. <laughs> Let you up here and you do that. Um, that's a really good question, Selena. Bless your heart. Bless your pee pig and heart. Um, <laughs> Learn from the best. No, no, bless you. Um, well, I got a little emotional too, I have to admit, watching I that know, just now. Just, you know what? Um, whew, I, just, I just think of my daddy in his health, on his heavenly balcony with mama. And, um, and I look at these service people right here, <laughs> men and women. And having grown up in the military for as long as I did, I just know the sacrifice, the absolute sacrifice. And what, why I get emotional is I remember when people did not know the Tuskegee Airmen. And now when you say Tuskegee Airmen, people are, I know. And I can't, and I just, I just thought, people are gonna say that now about the Harlem Hellfighters. Well, we need and a movie that, like The Red Tails. That's what we need. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm working on it, I'm working on it. Okay. Right. <laughs> but uh, but that, that's where the emotion comes from, because I remember the pride that I felt. And it's much like how when you started, I love how you got animated talking about my cousin, my second cousin, third cousin, and then I called auntie, and she said, and then, and then there's gonna be so many people after they watch the film that premieres Sunday on the History Channel, they're gonna have those same conversations and just knowing that and knowing what it meant for me, um, it makes me emotional. It does, and you know, speaking of the service men and women that we have here tonight of the 369th Infantry, can you guys stand up so we can give you a round of yeah. applause? <laughs> Absolutely. We, we honor you. We salute you, and I, that, I wanted to talk about the legacy, the legacy that is being carried through these uh, service members. Professor Sammons, can you talk more about that legacy that was created uh, in the early 1900s that today lives on through these very servicemen and women? Well, I think something else that this film demonstrates is that World War I was important for black progress for the black freedom struggle. Now, whites might have talked badly about us, but that wasn't really the point. The point was, what did blacks gain in their own, what did they internalize from what they saw that blacks did in that war? And that was something that couldn't be taken uh, away from them. So we tend to think of civil rights coming after World War II that blacks went into World War I blindly and didn't ask anything in return. We know about the double V, uh, victory at home and victory abroad uh, in World War II. But don't sell World War I short in terms of changing the black mindset about what was possible. And that's what's really important about it. Could I say something else about legacy? Uh, one of the really important uh, members of the 369th Regiment is Horace Pippin. Horace Pippin is one of the greatest artists of all time. And he said that the war brought out all the art in him. There's someone else who's really important too to the legacy, and that is Napoleon Bonaparte Marshall, uh, who was a lawyer, uh, a captain in the 369th, uh, who became a leader in the Free Haiti Movement. So that says something else about and a uh, good name. See. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And there's a Hannibal uh, Davis as well, so. 
but the struggle continues. And, and James, speaking of the struggle, the legacy continues and the struggle continues. How would you define the legacy of the Harlem uh, Hellfighters, and now, again, now that you know even more about your own grandfather? Well, the lieutenant, as the uh, Europe family affectionately refers to my grandfather, um, he's the backbone of the Europe family legacy, and we're very proud of him and everything that he's done is something that reflects on the Europe family as a whole. And I know that uh, in a couple of days, the entire family is gonna be together at one of our homes and we're gonna have a watch party and everyone's gonna watch it together. And there'll be drinks and snacks and... <laughs> as there should. And you'll have a good time. Yeah, there, there, there's also a 369th experience, which is uh, uh, basically a recreation of the Harlem Hellfighters band. Uh, Jim is involved in that. Miss Stephanie Neal is the director of that project. They're going to perform in the Macy's Day Thanksgiving Parade. This, oh, this wow. Uh, under, so, oh, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And by the way, they're a uh, 5013C charity, and you can go on their website and donate. Um, do you know the website link? Yes, offhand? I do. Can you share that with us? 69th Experience. There you go, that's amazing. And I just love how, again, this legacy is just living on. That is fascinating. Obviously, the documentary is keeping the legacy alive. Robin, for you, how would you, how would you define the legacy of the Harlem Hellfighters? I think it was best said in the film, um, empowerment. Empowerment. Um, fierce dedication, persistence, excellence. I think their legacy, and I'm so glad that they're now going to be better known, is that because all, when you've just put together history, and they haven't had their place in history, and I humbly say I'm glad that people know about the Tuskegee Airmen. That was World War II. When you have to go back and you have to, it, does, it, it just didn't happen where we are now, and yes, there's still work to be done, but it just didn't happen overnight. And they are going to be a part of the legacy and what we have fought for and what we are experiencing now. That's part of their legacy. You could say that Tuskegee Airmen stood on the soldiers, on, on the shoulders of the Hellfighters. Absolutely. We, we all can mm -hmm. in one way or another, especially when you talk about how they redefine what it meant to be black in America, especially as black men. And, and they sort of... Um, became the antithesis of what white propaganda was saying about them and white supremacy when it came to just the fear mongling and the fact that they were saying these men weren't, you know, good enough and they, you know, didn't have courage, but they, they proved otherwise. When they returned, um, Professor Samus, can you just talk about maybe just, um, just that sentiment that they were, you know, surrounded by? Like, how, how do you go from, you know, Europe and um, France being celebrated and coming back here and being, you know, just dehumanized. It was very difficult to say the least, but the 369th had a kind of different experience than other units in, black units in World War I and black soldiers in World War I, in that when they came back, they had a 15th New York Guard in which many, of the men went, uh, which would eventually come back to be the 369th, because the 369th was decommissioned after the war. There was no 369th, but there was a 15th New York Guard, which is strictly New York State, and that gave them a place that other <coughs> regiments didn't have. And there was a lot of radicalization of blacks. There was tr the war was a transformative experience. Um, and, you know, many went over as elevator operators, as red caps, et cetera, uh, and came back as cosmopolitans, as, as men who had, you know, defeated the Hun. Uh, so, as Jim said in the film, it's hard to put them back on the farm when they've seen gay Paris. So th that's a part of it, but it was a struggle. Uh, to not be recognized properly. Henry Johnson suffered emotionally and physically mm. 
William Butler, who's another great hero of the 369th, committed suicide. Needham Roberts, who was in the fracas with Henry, committed suicide after the war. So there's that kind of emotional toil as well from what they saw, but also of not being properly recognized for what they had done. So those are really uh, you know, some of the things that I think that uh, stand, uh, stand out in that regard. You know, we really gotta get these stories out there. Thank you, Robin, and thank you to both for, for what you're doing, because when you just hear about all the other stories and the fact that, you know, Henry Johnson, you showed in the documentary, I think he died, what, 10 years after coming home? And because he couldn't find a job and he couldn't find work. And, and the same thing even happened to one of my relatives. When he got back, um, he could not find work. And he ends up working at Penn Station only for tips. He could not find a salaried job. Um, you know, when we just think about the, the detriment, um, James, did you? Well, my grandfather was killed three months after he came back from the most violent war in human history. And three months later, he was stabbed to death by his drummer. Did you think there was a conspiracy around that? Or was it really his, his drummer? That well, you talk about a conspiracy about his death, you mean? Yeah. I've heard it in one place, but not many places, that he was, he was slashed in the throat by the drummer and his band. They took him to the hospital, where one person said, because there was no black blood available, that he was left to bleed out. Now, I don't know how true that is, I've only read that in one place, but who knows? Wow. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just, it's, it's heart-wrenching. Um, and when I look at that film and I see those two guys playing the drums, I say, one of those son of a killed my grandfather. <laughs> I don't know which one it was, but. Uh, I'm, not I'm not following that. that <laughs> not, not, nonetheless, James. Um, there was something else I was going to say, and I can't remember, but I'll, I'll say <laughs> I can't remember what I was going to say after that. Moment moment here, so. I also want to point out that the regimental numbers above 300 meant that they were draft units. This was an all-volunteer unit, and they felt that their 369th designation was an insult. I read that as well, but as we do have to pre prepare to wrap up the conversation, um, again, I learned so much about uh, James Reese Europe and the contributions he made to ragtime and jazz. What is it that you want the audience and viewers to take away with them when they think of your grandfather, James Reese Europe? What do you want them to think? On some of the playbills I've seen, he abbreviated his first name as J-A-S, jazz. Now, some people have said, where I've read, they named jazz after him. That's my story. I'm sticking with it. And he was the first man to coin the phrase gig. Yes, gig. And I want to point out the gig this morning, this afternoon, that was my son playing the guitar out there. Robert Foster Europe. Amazing. And there's also a James Reese Europe IV. He's a lieutenant commander. He's out at sea. He couldn't make it. Amazing. The Europe legacy continues to live on. Professor I'm surrounded Sammons. by lieutenants. I never serve. <laughs> 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 Professor Sammons, uh, what are some of the takeaways that you hope viewers walk away with after watching this documentary on Sunday? Oh. <laughs> I of the remarkable experience of these um, black soldiers, their service and sacrifice, but also <laughs> uh, what they accomplished under incredible odds uh, that were stacked up against them. Um, I, I would be remiss if I don't mention one person, though. Um, and uh, I don't think the regiment would have existed without him, and his name is Charles Ward Fillmore who had been a major in the Ohio National Guard, went to Washington, D.C., and when blacks had decided in New York that they needed a black National Guard regiment because the 8th Illinois had been in existence for some time, officered by blacks from top down, and so Charles Ward Fillmore was a member of the um, 
uh, greater equity con at the Equity Congress of Greater New York. And one of their objectives was among having blacks on the police force, fire department, in public office. In 1911, that was when the first black policeman was in New York, uh, Samuel Battle. But in any event, uh, Fillmore was the one who led the movement to establish a black regiment, which started, he started his movement in 1910 and managed to keep it together through all kinds of obstacles until a colored provisional regiment until 1916 when they were formally recognized as the 15th New York National Guard. Um, and uh, <laughs> what's that? They're no, no, that's, that, right now, that, that's Charles Young. That's Charles Young. That, that's another story, but Charles Young uh, was declared unfit health-wise uh, uh, by the uh, Woodrow Wilson administration. Uh, and to prove his fitness, um, he rode a horse from Wilberforce, Ohio, uh, to Washington, D.C. Uh, but not only did he not ride, he walked to give the horse rest. So it would be, you know, partially riding, partially walking. Wow. And when he arrived in Washington, the military officials said, you have only proven that uh, the horse is fit. Uh, oh, not gosh. You. But one other thing, he was taken out of active duty because he would have been in line to become a general and lead a brigade. And then after the war, he was returned to active duty, sent to Africa, I think it was either Ghana or Liberia, and died of a tropical disease oh. uh, in 1923. Professor, so. I'm trying to end this on a high note. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm really saying, trying. I was like, it's clean. I was like. <laughs> But I would like to, to, to end on a high note because I... Please do, Robin. No, um, I, I would like everyone who, has been, who was involved in the production here, Mary Donahue, Rock and Robin team, <laughs> Radical, everybody who was involved to please stand so you can be recognized as well. Everyone who had a role in the film, I want you. Amazing. Thank you. We salute Thank you. you. Appreciate you very much. Th thank you for doing that, Rama. We're going to give you the last word here. Uh, takeaways. What do you want everyone to walk away with after they watch this film? And when are you going to do another one? Because, I mean, the reception that you're receiving tonight and, and what the world is about to watch, we need more of this. And, there, and more is coming. Stay tuned. More is coming. I have great partnerships. And that, but my, 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 my final word is I got to get up at 3.30 for Good Morning America. No. <laughs> no. We got to go. <laughs> we got to go. No. Uh, no, my, my, Selena, first of all, thank you so much. Thank you for everything that you represent, your family. Love hearing that the, your family is going to be having yes, a, watch a watch party. party. And uh, get the word out. That's, that's my final say, is, is that more people need to know about these stories. And so anything that you can do to share and uh, let people know. But I'm, I'm extremely, extremely honored and so proud of, of what we did together to bring this story and make it known because it should not be the greatest story unknown. It needs to be known and it Absolutely. will be. Absolutely. One more time for the Harlem Hellfighters. Robin Roberts, James Reese Europe, and Professor Sammons. Thank you, sir.